morning. Welcome. My name is Grace Holly. Um, I'm one of the scientists at the Center for Addiction Research at BC, and we're very delighted to be co-hosting this talk with research and capacity building in DHA. And I'm just thrilled on Friday morning to see um, the room full. And I told John he's a really big draw. Um, so I'm going to just very quickly um, introduce John. Um, but before that, I do that, I just want to acknowledge um, the unceded territory of the First Nations people on whom we are gathering together today and for the privilege of being here. Um, I'm very um, delighted um, to introduce John, and I've come to know him uh, fairly recently because he is collaborating with us on our program of research in the area of managed alcohol programs. And so we had a wonderful afternoon yesterday um, looking at uh, some of our protocols in the research and getting his value of expertise. And it's such an amazing thing when you can sit down with a clinician and a researcher to understand both sides of, of the practice and walk through what, what was happening um, in some of our data. Um, that's my sort of informal introduction to you, John. But uh, formally, he is an internal medicine. Uh, he's in internal medicine and addiction medicine in Sydney and Brisbane, Australia. He originally uh, graduated from University of Cambridge in the UK, and he's a clinician, researcher, teacher, and director of addiction services for over 40 years. Um, internationally, he has been responsible for the development of the World Health Organization's audit questionnaire, has published four books, and is a highly cited researcher. Currently, he is a member of the Substance Use Disorders Working Group of the World Health Organization, and previous, um, prior to that, was part of the DSM-5 Substance Use Disorders Research Working Group. So I'm really looking forward to your talk, John. I love the title. What is this thing called addiction? So I'm looking forward to the answer. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to, uh, to be here. Um, I'll uh, try to constrain myself. I've been told to uh, stick around the lectern here because um, it will uh, pick up my voice for transmission and also uh, uh, ensure that you can all hear me in this room. And is, is it working? You can all hear me. Okay. Um, as Bernie said, I chose uh, a, a rather um, a uh, provocative title of what is this thing called addiction. And I chose it on purpose because um, addiction and indeed the nature of what we might call substance use disorder, substance use problems, um, has been a subject for considerable debate, indeed considerable controversy. If um, you, know, you, you, you had a visit or the human race had a visit from an alien from another planet, the alien would say, um, it's really quite easy what these addictive disorders are. They're related to a particular substance. Or maybe these human beings do something uh, silly like sort of gambling too much. Um, so what's the problem? Um, you disagree about the nature of these disorders. There are all sorts of different conceptualizations. And the alien might come to the conclusion that we human beings aren't half as smart as we think we are. Now, what am I going to be doing? Well, I'm going to be taking you through some of the historical background uh, to our conceptualization of substance use and addictive disorders. I'm going to bring you up to date with uh, what we know is happening uh, at, at a brain level and also how these disorders are then uh, captured in uh, DSM-5 and what currently we're doing as part of WHO's uh, uh, work on the development of the international classification of uh, diseases and specifically the substance use disorders section. So in summary, we know the causes of addictions. You know, they are, for example, alcohol or alcohol in excess, heroin, methamphetamine, gambling, gaming, certain forms of gaming and electronic activities. So it should be simple. But there are so many competing philosophies, so many schools of thought, which have not, in my view, integrated sufficiently well, and we disagree about what is it. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to attempt some kind of synthesis uh, of the knowledge that we have. And uh, 
summarise what we uh, what has been done in DSM-5 and what is being done at the moment in preparation for publication of uh, IC-11 in about three years. These are some of the competing schools of thought. No wonder our alien is puzzled. And so, what do we have? We have views that substance use or repetitive substance use represent some form of moral failure. Your neighbours across the border call it moral turpitude. A wonderful 19th century name which still features on the US visas. These days, we would call it a uh, character defect. In the 19th century, the sins of the father visiting upon the sons. In fact, where does that come from? That comes from Genesis, the Bible. Uh, so it goes back a long way. And you see this um, illustrated in this very famous line engraving by Hogarth. And this, of course, is Gin Lane in, uh, in uh, uh, London. And when you look at this uh, um, engraving and you see this rather dissolute woman uh, who's so intoxicated, she's just the, her baby who she's breastfeeding, who has fallen out uh, over the um, o over the railing uh, onto the floor below. Would you not think, if you were an observer of that scene, if you were the alien, might you think that that person is suffering from some kind of moral failure, character defect, uh, to get herself into this situation? The modern day equivalent of moral failure or character defect, and this is not just a historical sort of, you know, bit of you know, uh, interest, the, mo the, the modern day equivalent of moral failure is the self-inflicted condition. Our politicians in Australia, particularly of certain political persuasions, use this self-inflicted condition very frequently. That's what they understand, that people who have substance disorders or addictions have brought it on entirely themselves and they are responsible for their own failures and uh, uh, if, if you come from a certain spectrum of politics then they just have to, um, you know, they just have to put up with it. That is actually very unhelpful. All these conceptualizations are very unhelpful for engaging people who have these disorders and it contributes to the negative view that so many of uh, our patients and the people who we provide services for and try to engage have of themselves. Okay, now we come to the issue of a personality disorder. Are substance disorders and addictions simply reflective of or even epiphenomena of a personality disorder? Well, well into the second half of the 20th century, this was assumed. Here are statements from DSM. The first edition was published in 1952. Substance use disorders are usually symptomatic of a personality disorder. A direct quotation. DSM-2, published in 1968, substance disorders are grouped within the personality disorders and they are only distinguished from them by the presence of withdrawal symptoms. The world, though, did move on. And by 1980, with the publication of DSM-3, substance use disorders were classified separately from personality disorders and for the very first time they had specific diagnostic criteria. And so, uh, the DSM-3 committee said, okay, these are discrete disorders in their own right and we need to distinguish them and have clear boundaries between them and other mental health or behavioural or personality disorders. Okay, coming back to this um, um, summary slide. A very prominent school of uh, thought um, has uh, been over uh, many years, particularly from the mid to late 1950s onwards, the epidemiological 
public health and social science uh, schools of thought. And of course, um, Canada has a great tradition uh, in this, uh, dating from the 1960s uh, onwards. Um, <coughs> the epidemic <coughs> theological school of thought <coughs> me, has a view that problematic alcohol and drug use is simply a phenomenon of excessive consumption. Consumption is the key thing in a society. Consumption in itself is determined by physical availability, price in relation to disposable income, cultural acceptance, and a variety of other societal influences. So uh, the, the school of thought, which has been very powerful, um, had a view quite correctly that um, can, uh, that the experience of disorder, the experience of problems due to substance use, was simply a reflection on the amount of that substance which was consumed in that particular community or that particular society. And what they also uh, uh, indicated is there is no special relationship between the various consequences of substance use. So this school of thought shifted the emphasis from the individual to the population at large. And I think has contributed very considerably, but I think some aspects of that understanding have been overstated and overemphasized. It certainly provides the rationale for the public health approach to alcohol and drug problems, uh, which is uh, certainly very much informs uh, um, public health and health department uh, policy and approaches, and importantly, does in inform also the development of harm reduction uh, approaches which we've experienced over the last 25 to 30 years. This uh, is an illustration <coughs> of this relationship. This is uh, from Sealy, um, and this is Canadian data, and you can see that I'll just have to Here, uh, you can see the relationship between the price of alcohol, the price of the use of alcohol here, coming down from 1929 to 1959, the paper published in 1960, as alcohol, price of alcohol comes down, so there is a concomitant increase in alcohol consumption per capita in the community, and so. Uh, with a bit of a lag, there is an increase in deaths from cirrhosis of the liver, which is a common proxy for alcohol-related mortality. So that is an absolutely fundamental study um, by Seeley, um, whose career I, I don't think survived too long after the uh, publication of his paper, because of course this hugely challenges the whole the whole concept of uh, you know, the, the promotion of alcohol consumption, the advertising, and so on. Okay. We now move on to the contributions made by behavioral psychology. Um, both, uh, and also uh, some of the earlier schools, such as classical or Pavlovian conditioning, operant conditioning, particularly influential has been social cognitive or social learning theory, uh, by uh, established by Alfred uh, Bandura in the 1970s. Now, uh, this uh, broadly, and please recognize that I'm, uh, I'm a physician, I'm not a behavioral psychologist, but this is my take on it, that the behavioral schools of thought, particularly social cognitive theory, uh, teaches that um, substance use, repetitive substance use, is an acquired behavior. Um, what uh, is learned can be unlearned. Use can be modified, therefore, and its original interpretation, can, uh, it is not necessary to abstain from the substance in order to move on in your life. Control substance use is feasible because you can unlearn the aberrant uh, behavioral patterns of repetitive substance use. This was the dominant view when I was, um, yeah, I suppose, learning my trade. Uh, in the um, mid-1970s. 
Now, we then have radically different takes on what substance disorders are. And they are uh, numbers 9 and 10. It's a disease. Um, it's a biological predisposition. Um, so the people who would say it's a disease often are the people who are in recovery themselves from a substance dependence or an addiction. Uh, do they have an understanding that perhaps some of the professional schools of thought don't? They certainly live that life. Okay. A biological predisposition. Um, this uh, is, is uh, exemplified by a statement that so many people say that I knew I was different because when I had my first drink or smoke of dope at the age of you know, 15, 16, um, it had an effect on me which, um, it, which was quite different to other people. So, in the population at large, there is also quite a wide view that people have a disease process. Okay. So, how is our alien coping with all these different understandings? Mm -hmm. Not well. What's he thinking of the human race? Not much. Okay. So, the disease concept, just returning to that, um, uh, so that was prominent, and uh, uh, many professional people, though, absolutely dismissed it and also dismissed the role of genetics. This is a quotation from a book which was published by these uh, folks from the UK in 1967. Alcoholism is inherited as wealth is inherited, i.e. through role modeling and through the family, not as eye color is. So genetics was dismissed at a stroke in this statement. So, competing understandings, no consensus, and importantly, the drug and alcohol field, in my view, has, over the last 70 to 80 years, been unable to present a coherent view of the nature of the conditions in which it claims expertise. Now, that's a very provocative statement that I'm making. But you speak to your politicians. You speak to senior advisors in the Ministry of Health or Ministry of you know, Social Welfare. And they will say, when I have advice from most professional groups, the advice clusters around a, 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 a centre. But in the drug and alcohol field, it's like this. And politicians have actually used that to indicate that th there is a huge disparity, a huge spectrum of understandings and the advice that they're given. So we do need to do something about it. We do need to have uh, some co a collective agreement on the nature of these disorders, which is based on all the available evidence, including the evidence from the experience who've had these of people who've had these disorders themselves. Now, a major development in this area was the description by Griffith Edwards and Milton Gross. Griffith Edwards from the Morton in the UK, Milton Gross from the USA, um, of a clinical syndrome of alcohol dependence. Importantly, this, uh, this description was descriptive. It simply stated what were the main features seen and experienced in people who were considered to have alcohol dependence. It was not a theoretical explanation, not etiological. A lot of the explanations that I've put up in my summary slide were um, uh, etiological or even theoretical ones. So this is purely descriptive. And what they said was that there does exist a syndrome of alcohol dependence. This syndrome it comprises a strong desire to drink alcohol, preoccupation with drinking, and in the proportion of people, withdrawal symptoms when they stop. This was taken up um, worldwide and featured in DSM-3R and also in ICD-10, which were published in uh, 1987 and 1992, respectively. 
The diagnosis of alcohol dependence is based, uh, as it's expressed in ICD-10, on these six central criteria, six central features, which are impaired control over drinking, a strong desire to drink alcohol, which might be called craving, or even compulsion, preoccupation with drinking, that's savings. Alcohol consumption is given greater priority over other activities and obligations in life. Increased tolerance to alcohol. Withdrawal symptoms, or the prevention of withdrawal symptoms by continually topping up. And then continuation of drinking despite harmful consequences. In ICD-10, you need three of these to occur together repeatedly in a clustered way to make that diagnosis for at least a year or continuously for one month. So this is a descriptive syndrome um, which is not beholden to any particular school of thought or etiology or philosophy. It's purely based on observation. Since 1976, the concept of the dependent syndrome, which is largely synonymous with the term addiction, has been uh, uh, accepted successively for a whole variety of different substances, and also, most more recently, gambling, and it looks as if it will apply to what we call uh, uh, gaming addiction, particularly uh, internet and electronic games addiction. It also applies to a certain extent to uh, other conditions which are ill-defined and uh, probably rather uncommon, like you know, exercise addiction. Okay, now, what have we learned over the last uh, 15 to 20 years in particular? Obviously, there have been continuing developments in our epidemiological knowledge. There have been continuing developments in our understanding of the psychological mechanisms by which uh, substances become repetitive. But accepting that in a number of people, substances does become repetitive through those psychological mechanisms, through the social influences, how does repetitive substance use then go on to something that we call addiction, which has um, uh, an inbuilt tendency to self-perpetuation, where instead of there being external influences which influence and determine the recurrence of repetitive substance use, there are internal things happening which do so. And to summarize all the neurobiological research would be an impossible task, uh, certainly in this time. But so what I've chosen to do is to give you some in the information on the neurocircuitry, the developments in the neurocircuitry of substance dependence and addiction, which I think has uh, given us the greatest insight to what is going on when we move from repetitive substance use, which is externally driven and can be internally controlled, to a form of use which cannot be easily or at all internally controlled. Essentially, there are four key neurocircuits which, uh, which are located in the upper part of the midbrain, the lower part of the forebrain, with projections to other parts of the, um, uh, of, of the uh, uh, forebrain. The first neurocircuit, which is reset in the addictive process, is the reward system. Essentially, Psychoactive substances initially activate reward pathways. Does that come as a surprise? No. Why do people take substances? <laughs> Absolutely. And so there's a well-defined reward pathway which courses from the ventral tegmental nucleus in the midbrain to the nucleus accumbens in the lower forebrain. The reward pathways are subserved by the opioid uh, system and also the dopaminergic system dopamine probably being the final common pathway 
for the experience of euphoria and the reinforcement of substance use. However, with repeated use of these substances, the activity of these reward systems is blunted. More substance is required to get for the person to have the effect that they're looking for. To, uh, and indeed, more substance becomes required to maintain a sense of comparative normality. This is tolerance, in part. Importantly, as a side effect of this, normal activities with rewarding effects become blunted or ineffective. And that would include walking along the harbour here, which is a lovely experience. I hope you never tire of it. It would include the company of friends and family. It would include for those who are into this sort of thing, abseiling, I believe that's considered to be a rewarding activity. It includes sex. Now, these naturally rewarding activities are seriously blunted in people who have a substance dependence by the suppression of the reward system <coughs> and the fact that the reward system, with its natural rewards, has been progressively taken over by that substance in the dependence process. A negative mood and motivational state ensues. So that describes some of the experiences of the people who you look after. So the reward system has been reset in the dependence process in a profound and enduring or hardwired way. Secondly, there is upregulation or overactivation of the alertness or the excitatory system. Most psychoactive substances suppress these systems, either directly or indirectly. With repeated substance use, there is activation of these brain stress or excitatory pathways as an adaptive mechanism to try to maintain a suitable level of alertness for survival reasons. The principal um, transmitters are um, glutamate, and CRF. There is uncoupling of the natural anti-stress systems involving GABA and neuropeptide Y. What this results is heightened activation to exposure to cues or triggers for substance use. Do your people who have addictions experience being triggered when they pass a, 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 a hotel or you know, a, 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 an alcohol outlet? Or the gam person with gambling addiction, does that person experience something when they pass a casino or a club where gambling is possible? Absolutely. Do people with these disorders experience a higher level of stress in their lives? Does that bubble over to anxiety, fear, agitation? Okay. The third pathway, which is reset, is what is termed the salience or priority pathway. Now these pathways course uh, in each direction from the lower forebrain to the cingulate gyrus of the frontal lobe. With repeated substance use, there is a rebalancing of this salience neurocircuitry in favor of continued substance use over other activities. Now, what are human beings' normal top priorities? Preservation of life, Number one, looking after your family and partner, yes. Uh, then a bit lower down would be maintaining your income, productive employment in these days, uh, having some fun. Okay, so those would be the top priorities in life. What happens with the development of a substance dependence is those priorities are skewed or perverted. What becomes the top of the priority list? Maintaining access to that substance. Maintaining the use of that substance. Sometimes recovering from the effects of the substance, only to look for more of the substance. So there is a resetting of the priorities through this salience neurocircuitry. Substance use becomes accorded progressively a higher priority for thinking and action over other tasks, enjoyments, and responsibilities. 
is that something that you see in the people who you are responsible for? Finally, there is impairment of the frontal inhibitory pathways. Now, the frontal inhibitory pathways come from the prefrontal gyrus of the frontal lobe, and they course downwards to the nucleus accumbens, which is the kind of reward center. Um, now, these are not particularly effective anyway, because you will appreciate that I mean, a lot of our behaviors and actions and even thoughts are instantaneous things. Uh, but the frontal lobes are designed to uh, stop our acting too much on those more primitive responses. Never terribly good um, in doing this. And what happens with the development of the substance dependence or addiction is that there is even less control of the, 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 the more primitive responses from the frontal lobe than they, than they used to be. And uh, you, you know, that, that means that you know, people become more re responsive in a rather primitive way rather than in a thinking or cognitive way. With continued substance use, these, uh, uh, the, 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 the damage to the frontal uh, lobe area can be, uh, uh, lead to deficiencies in executive functioning, uh, decision-making, and so on. So, just a summary of what we've learned from the work on uh, neurocircuitry. Repetitive substance use induces profound and persistent changes in these four key neurocircuits. Reward, excitation or alertness, salience, and behavioral inhibition. The reward system becomes underactive. It's become hijacked by the addictive process. The excitatory system is overactivated, resulting in tension, anxiety, fear, triggering. The failing system is subverted. Priorities become skewed. And I summarize all this as three neurocircuits which uh, are collectively contributing to a powerful internal drive and one neurocircuit, the fourth one, being essentially withered away and not providing any capacity for breaking, uh, yeah, for putting it the brakes on, though that, 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 that internal drive. And so you have an internal driving force which is generated, which drives and directs further substance use and is little influenced at this stage in the process by voluntary control. Okay, what's the overall picture? I hope you like this diagram. Um, when you, if you go to a talk on neurocircuitry or any uh, talk on neurobiology, you will come across extraordinary complicated diagrams uh, which are designed to impress rather than designed to educate, in my view. This is not one of those. <laughs> this is a diagram which I drew um, a few years ago now when I was attempting to uh, you know, you know, demonstrate the, you know, the location, you know, the, the fundamentals of the addiction process. And I couldn't find a, a suitable um, uh, you know, uh, accurate, uh, anatomically accurate um, uh, diagram of the brain, so I had to draw this myself. This is my 17th attempt at drawing a head, and the uh, uh, the eye there, and the what I call the midbrain and the lower forebrain. If you want to see my 16 attempts, they're on my computer, and periodically I go around you know the world with you know, demonstrate them in art. <laughs> okay. Now, is it a primary biological disorder? The evidence is no. Biological mechanisms are vitally important. Um, and uh, there are certainly very powerful susceptibility influences. But it's not primarily uh, a specific biological disorder. Almost certainly not. 
the repeated use of alcohol, nicotine, certain addictive medications, and certain addictive drugs, which I've listed there. So the starting point is a pattern of repetitive substance use, which leads through the process that I've described, a maladaptive response in those neurocircuits, which are reset, and not just transiently, but in the long term, producing what I call the driving force we note here that there are prominent um, uh, individual factors and social influences. Of course there are. Let's see what some of those might be. Genetic factors. We know that uh, from biometrical genetic studies that somewhat over half of the variance in uh, a person's use of a particular substance or whether they have a dependence or not, is related to genetic factors. These genetic factors uh, are proving rather difficult to um, uh, uh, identify for all the substances, but at this point, for alcohol, for example, genome-wide association studies have indicated 40 genes approximately which are important. And their genes which uh, uh, influence or determine taste preference, um, uh, the internal structure of the uh, you know, neurons, and also some of the key neurotransmitters. All of these tend to seem to be important. Um, so collectively, the genetic influence is a is a big, and in most studies, it's the single most important factor predisposing somebody to a substance dependence. So you can understand how people come to the conclusion that they are biologically different. Uh, to some extent, that is true, but there isn't, there isn't a single unifying bi biological difference which underlies all these differences. Secondly, abuse in childhood. This has become increasingly uh, prominent and we've become increasingly aware of the impact of various forms of abuse in childhood and we now know some of the mechanisms by which this influences substance use. This, uh, you know, is, is clearly a vital uh, comorbidity and antecedent and is important uh, particularly if you are in clinical practice. So uh, by abuse, I mean physical abuse, more common in men who have substance disorders and addictions, sexual abuse, more common in women who have these disorders, and emotional deprivation or severe uh, mental uh, or emotional abuse or abandonment. Number three, trauma in adult life, um, particularly seen in returning uh, you know, military personnel, um, many of whom develop uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Primary psychiatric disorders, the association is actually not as strong as I would have expected. Um, when you take the other, you know, the genetics, the abuse and the trauma <coughs> out of the equation. So we do know that there are uh, strong associations with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and uh, as I've mentioned, the abuse and trauma-related disorders. There are weaker associations with depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. So if you're looking at odds ratios, for bipolar disorders between 5 and 10 or 11, for schizophrenia between 4 and 7, depending on the substance, for depressive disorders it tends to be between you know, 1.3 and about sort of 2.2, 2.3. Um, okay. Physical disorders, less commonly, but often very importantly, and there are certain personality variables which may also relate to early childhood experiences or genetic factors, and uh, impulsivity and rebelliousness are the two which are most uh, commonly described. But there is no evidence for a unifying personality variable, certainly no evidence from recent data of a unifying personality disorder. So we can throw out the DSM-1, DSM-2 concepts uh, into the bin. Okay. 
Moving forward, um, you can make this uh, simple diagram as complicated as you want. Uh, what I've got here is uh, to indicate as well as antecedent factors, individual factors, social influences, um, including many of the influences that I, I said have come from the epidemiological um, uh, uh, work over many years. You also, in the bottom left corner, uh, can note the consequences of so various medical illnesses, brain damage, mental disorder, and social problems. But you will see, even though I'm an internal medicine physician and originally you know, gastroenterologist, a hepatologist, I do not put the alcoholic cirrhosis as the number one disorder. It may be the disorder that kills people, but the number one disorder is what has caused that, and that is the dependence or the addiction. And then in this one, which is basically the complete situation, I have um, added a couple of um, uh, arrows to indicate that these uh, consequences, rather than stopping uh, or halting the addictive process, often contribute to it further. If you've got brain damage from alcohol, for example, are you more or less likely to be able to engage in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy? Or have an insight into what is going on in your life? If you have an acquired depression, is that going to help? Or is that going to make you more likely to try and have some further temporary relief from your feelings by drinking more or taking more substance? So what you have here is something that easily becomes a vicious circle, not only because of the, um, you know, the, the, the fundamental driving force, but also the fact that the consequences often add further fuel to the fire, as it were. Okay. Now, I'm now going to move on by what I hope is a synthesis um, of you know, the, the, how epidemiology, epidemiological factors, uh, behavioral uh, psychological factors, uh, the presence of certain underlying disorders, adverse experiences in, in childhood um, and at other times contribute to the development of this self-perpetuating internal driving force. Now, how does DSM-5 uh, deal, deal with this? As uh, Bernie said in her introduction, I was involved in the um, first phase, the research and agenda setting phase of DSM-5, so I wasn't involved with the writing of the editorial phase, which resulted in the publication of DSM-5 in May uh, 2013. Um, so there are some good things about DSM-5. Uh, could, I, could I just ask, through a show of hands, how many of you are using DSM-5 either clinically or in your policy or educational areas? A number, yeah. Okay. So DSM-5 has got some good things. It's got a new chapter, Addictive Disorders, which encompasses what used to be called the psychoactive substance use disorders, but also uh, the non-substance addictions of which the main inclusion is a gambling addiction which they call disordered gambling. So that's been shifted from impulse control disorders to the addictive disorders. Other uh, behavioral and electronic addictions like internet gaming are mentioned as candidate diagnoses um, likely to be included in this chapter as the evidence for their addictive uh, uh, mechanisms becomes clearer. There are new clinical syndromes. DSM-4 did not recognize cannabis withdrawal. DSM-5 does recognize cannabis withdrawal. And there is, as you will note, compelling evidence for the existence of a cannabis withdrawal syndrome. Um, and uh, there are now well-established features, well-established criteria, and it features in DSM-5. Cannabis withdrawal, just in passing, can be a big deal. It uh, tends to go on for three to four weeks. Okay. It was decided, rather than to use the term substance dependence, to change it to addiction. Um, I personally prefer the term substance dependence. Um, addiction, uh, I, I suppose I've grown up to 
uh, in the view that the simple unqualified term addiction was rather sort of negative and perjurative, even though I've used it in the title of my talk uh, today. Um, anyway, that's, that's uh, too much of a deal. But what is, I think, a deal is that despite, in spite of the burgeoning evidence for the mechanisms, including the neurobiological and the um, neurocircuitry evidence, that there's been a very significant broadening in DSM-5 of uh, what used to be substance dependence to include substance abuse. And there are 11 criteria for this new diagnosis, almost, but not quite, they lump together the sub-7 DSM-4 substance dependence criteria and the 4 DSM-4 substance abuse criteria. Put them together and said, okay, this is a new disorder. The rationale is that it was supported by uh, uh, epidemiological studies. I mean, there is a continuity in these processes that I've described. I'm not, I'm not you know, you know, describing dependence as occurring because of a thunderbolt from, from above. It's not an all or nothing thing. Of course, there are dimensions of it. But one of the important things about diagnoses is that they are designed to help us communicate with our peers, with our patients, and to be able to say in a couple of words what is the general nature of the, the disorder, the condition that that person has. So DSM-4 substance dependence, in fact, uh, performed very well as a diagnostic entity. So these are the 11 criteria for DSM-5 substance use disorder, covering alcohol, uh, prescribed medications, and all the, uh, you know, all the, the recreational type uh, drugs. So how do you read them out? These are tied. Get that? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, why would you want to have 11 criteria which you've got to memorize, supposedly, for a single damn diagnosis. Huh? How are you going to teach your students that? Okay, and also, what we've learned about addiction and dependence is that it is a syndromal clustered disorder. Things tend to occur together. They tend to feed each other. And in DSM-5, you have the ultimately disaggregated condition. I did a calculation and uh, calculated that um, there are 2,036 possible combinations of the uh, two or more criteria, uh, which is the cutoff point, two or more criteria for the diagnosis of substance use disorder. Okay. You're going to remember 2,036 different combinations? I mean, frankly, I think it's laughable. I don't think Although I think there's some good things in DSM-5, I think that uh, this uh, has actually done a disservice to all of us in clinical practice and, um, uh, you know, and, and policy and prevention. And if you have such a disaggregated syndrome and 11 criteria, can you explain it to your bedmaker's daughter? I see looks of utter incomprehension in front of me. I need two more minutes, Bernie, to explain this. I went, like the director of CARBC, to one of England's ancient universities. He went to one, I went to the other one. The university, in its wisdom, regarded 18-year-old boys, and that's what we were, uh, very few girls, uh, and we were boys rather than young men, as ill-formed creatures who were not able to do simple tasks like make their own bed. In my case, that was perfectly true. My mother always made my bed. And so you allocated a bed maker. And my bed maker was uh, a lovely lady for three years called Doris. And uh, she looked after six of us. Um, and uh, every morning she would bring in, uh, as well as cleaning, making up the bed and cleaning the room and everything, she would bring in on a silver tray a cup of tea and some biscuits. That was student life for me. Um, I didn't, I thought that was normal. Was it like that for you? 
<laughs> but the point of this is that I was taught in that first year that I would be expected to explain what I was learning or later what I was researching in straightforward language that the bed maker's daughter would understand. That was a key consideration. And so, does DSM-5, with its 11 criteria, pass that test? Do patients, are patients able to understand what's happening with them by reading those criteria, to some extent? So do they understand what a driving force is? Oh yes. Oh yes. Do they understand the diagrams? Absolutely. Because I, three to four times a week when I'm back in Sydney, I run group programs for patients in different hospitals. They get it. Even when I explain some of the more complicated you know, circuitry and say, you know, your natural rewards are blunted. Ooh, yeah. They get it. So the medical students who often sit in for these sessions get it. eventually. But the patients get it because that's the life that they are experiencing. Okay. So um, I think DSM-5 has lost sight of the essential nature of dependence and addiction. I think there is a realization amongst uh, people who were involved in the writing phase that this is the case um, and that um, you know some of the biometrical uh, uh, evidence has dominated um, DSM-5 and uh, unfortunately the, the very important neurobiological evidence has uh, frustratingly for all those involved um, not had uh, sufficient in my view influence. Finally, in the last three or four minutes I'm going to talk about the current developments in ICD-11. As Ben said, I'm a member of the Substance Use Disorders Working Group for uh, WHO in developing ICD-11 and this has been running for a few years now um, and is due for publication, well, due for approval uh, by the World Health Assembly in probably uh, 2017, maybe a year earlier, and due for publication in 2017. Could I ask, please, that the, the following diagrams not be copied because although I can uh, talk about them, and in a presentation, I'm not permitted to make copies available. So, and because it's very much a work in progress. Okay. Uh, this is okay. I mean, this is in the public domain. This. So, the the the, the I think process is based on what is called a content form. You've got to name the disorder. You've got to define it. You've got to have some diagnostic guidelines or criteria. You've got to be able to differentiate from, from normality and from other disorders. Because DSM-5, if you drink excessively twice a year um, and uh, you um, experience uh, some problems as well, you have a diagnosis. Is that what we mean by addiction? Is that what we mean by disorder for which some significant form of treatment or intervention is required? I think not. Okay. At the moment, uh, we have these uh, diagnoses in uh, the draft ICD-11. Acute intoxication, harmful substance use, substance dependence, substance withdrawal, and then there are substance use mental disorders. This is the draft definition of substance dependence or addiction. It's a chronic disorder regulation of psychoactive substance use. It's an acquired disorder arising from repeated or continuous use of that substance. There are certain characteristic features and use of the substance increasingly becomes a central focus of that person's life and relegates other interest activities to the periphery. The draft criteria, diagnostic criteria, are three. So we've reduced from, so far, from six to three, whereas DSM-5 has 11. Impaired control. The drive to use the substance and physiological features, which are tolerance to withdrawal. At the moment, you need two of those three central features to make a diagnosis of dependence or addiction. 
And so, in summary, what is this thing called addiction? It's an acquired psychobiological syndrome characterized by the shift to an internal driving force to consume a substance. Furthermore, we know that as addiction becomes more and more entrenched, it becomes a more interconnected and tighter entity. It's not just a tick box of symptoms, it's something that we as professionals in the field have to understand, have to understand the nature and the boundaries of the disorder because our patients do.